Hey there, and welcome to Gross, Weird, and Wacky Wildlife, the fourth of 14 live sessions on both YouTube and Facebook that are part of the digital 2021 Wyoming Outdoor Expo. And a special welcome to those of you joining from classrooms across Wyoming and beyond. If you need to leave early, you can always come back to the recordings on the Wyoming Game and Fish Department YouTube channel, Facebook page, or wyomingexpo.com. This session will last about 30 minutes, and we want to hear your questions and answers. So keep your thinking caps on and don't get too far away from that keyboard. To get warmed up, I have two questions for you, and I'd like you to answer them in the comments. Where are you watching from? And if you're part of a classroom, tell us your grade level and school name too. And what do you think the grossest animal is? And then let's see if Jackie mentions it. All right, where are you from? And what do you think the grossest animal is? All right, so without further ado, here's our gross, weird, and wacky wildlife enthusiast, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Gross, Weird, and Wacky Wildlife. I'm your host, Jackie Jamby, and I'm a conservation educator with Wyoming Game and Fish. This event, like Catherine said, will be a combination of facts, trivia, and clips of wildlife being super duper gross. We encourage you to participate by commenting on whatever platform you're using to watch this. All of our featured species today are found in Wyoming and in other parts of the country. So if you think one of these critters is super gross or wacky or weird, see if you can spot one in the wild safely sometime. Some of our species today are gonna to be managed by Wyoming Game and Fish, uh, while others are just kind of fun to learn about. So today we're gonna to start off by learning about the teeniest, tiniest critters you can find. Let's go. Awesome, we're starting out with microorganisms. Basically, it just means that they're really, really small, so small that you have to use a microscope to see them. You can't see them without help from that. So I want everyone to go ahead and close your eyes and imagine that you are super, super small. Nope, smaller than that. Nope, keep imagining even smaller than that. Awesome, and imagine, keep those eyes closed, that you are so, so tiny and you're floating around in maybe a local pond or a stream or even a mud puddle in your backyard. And as you're floating peacefully along, you, bam, run into this creature. Go ahead and open your eyes. What could it possibly be? Before I tell you what it's called, I want you to, in the comments, go ahead and tell me what you think it is. What would you name it if you were the scientist that discovered this weird, wacky piece of wildlife? Make sure that whatever you comment is school appropriate. Um, some comments that I, or some things that I think that I would call it if I was a scientist would be, mm, I think, ugly paper bag. That's, I think, the very first name that I would come up with. Um, something one of my friends said that they would call it a weird face and leg thing. Um, what are some of the other comments that we've got, Catherine? I've got um, people watching from Manhattan, Kansas. We have people watching from Wisconsin. We have a one-room schoolhouse in Decker, Montana, K through 8. Welcome, everybody. And then we also have um, some schools from around Wyoming, Rollins, Casper, Gannett Peak, uh, grade three. So we got all kinds of folks. All right. We have, and we have a water bear. Is, Ooh, is what good job, Dana. In it. All right. And Galapagos. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, y'all, what scientists have actually called it is a tardigrade. Tardigrade in Latin means slow steppers because they're known for moving super, super small. But they're also called a water bear. So Dana and a few others got it totally right. Another name that they're called is moss piglet, which I just think is absolutely adorable. Now, tardigrades are really, really, really small creatures. A common flea is about three times larger than a tardigrade. Um, the tardigrade is about 0.5 uh, millimeters big, while a common flea is 1.5 millimeters. So they're both super tiny, but the tardigrade is even smaller than the flea by about one third. They're also adorable. I mean, look at that face. Is it a face? I don't know if it's a face, but they're adorable. And the wackiest, weirdest thing about them is that they are absolutely incredible and they can be found pretty much everywhere. 
Some of these incredible things about them is that they can survive for up to 30 years without food or water. I can hardly go 30 minutes. They can also be found in space. They are able to survive in areas with as much pressure as six times the deepest trench in the ocean. So imagine when you go to the bottom of a swimming pool, but keep swimming like for a really, really long time and the pressure that builds up in your ears, tardigrades are totally fine with that. They can survive nuclear radiation and extreme dryness. The way that they survive these really harsh conditions is even wackier. What they do is they curl their little bodies into a ball and squeeze out almost all of the water. Basically, they become a tardigrade raisin and they just chill out like that for a couple of decades or longer. Imagine if you were going through a bad day, you could just say, nah, I'm gonna wait this one out. Squeeze out all your water and just hang out there for a while. That would be amazing. Um, I love this comic too. I think it really does a great job showing off how adaptable and survivable these wacky creatures are. Uh, my favorite part is at the end when the little tardigrade says, we forgot to eat for 30 years, walked to the South Pole, got blasted by radiation and survived a meteor impact extinction event or two. But I guess I'm okay. I think that's a great thing about tardigrades. Now, even though they can survive in all those crazy places, their preferred habitat is moss and lichen, generally in water. So we have lots of water here in Wyoming and in that water, you might be able to find things like moss or lichen. Next time you find something like that, go ahead and look at it under a microscope and see if you can find a water bear. This is um, just a goofy meme <laughs> about water bears. Uh, so right now we're gonna take some questions from the audience, see if anyone has come up with anything at this point about water bears or any other wacky wildlife questions. Well, Jackie, we've got, uh, we don't have any questions yet, but we have folks that have uh, introduced themselves from New, Mex New Meadows, Idaho, the first grade class. We have a fifth grade class from Oklahoma City wow. um, and the Pinedale Middle School. Um, and they knew that that was a water bear. Um, <laughs> awesome, welcome everyone. It's so great to have you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we started off as teeny tiny creatures and now we're getting a little bit bigger to something you can see without the help of a microscope. We're moving on to herps. This section is going to be trivia, so it's going to require you to comment whether you think a fact is true or false. Um, a herp is just a kind of shorthand way, way to talk about reptiles or amphibians uh, because herpetology is the study of both reptiles and amphibians. So let's do our first trivia question. Touching a toad can give you warts. Go ahead and comment. Do you think that's true or false? While you're commenting, I just want to give you a couple facts about this fun creature right here. That is the Wyoming toad. Um, it's only found in Albany County in Wyoming, and they can be kind of considered um, federally endangered as well as um, locally extinct. However, there are lots of programs that are trying to reintroduce this species into the wild. So let's see, we've got a couple people, quite a few pe people saying false, a couple trues. Let's see. Oh, it is false. Frogs and their cousins toads have really cool and creepy and gross things about them, but they don't cause warts. So if you do, end up finding one and catching one in the wild, you should still wash your hands before and after touching it, but you don't need to do that to prevent warts just because it's best practices when you're handling wildlife. Now, this next video I have for you shows one of the grossest things about frogs and toads. When they eat, they use their eyes to help push the food down their throats. They don't have the same types of muscles that we have in our uh, throats that we can use to swallow things. So they have to use their eyeballs to push it down. Imagine if every bite of food you took, you had to use your eyes, you had to close them and squeeze your food down with them. That'd be pretty gross. Now, our next question is, the short horn lizard can shoot blood from its eyes when threatened. Go ahead and comment. Do you think that's true or false? This creature, while you're all commenting, um, is the uh, Wyoming state reptile. Sometimes people call them horned toads, uh, but they're not toads, they're just lizards. They have a tail, so they're not a toad. Um, they call them toads because their bodies get really flat and wide, especially when they're being threatened. 
Let's see, we've got some people saying, oh, nice, <laughs> ew. <laughs> oh, we have some people saying it's true. Does anyone think that it's false? I think it's a pretty crazy thing to believe. I don't know, let's see. It is true. <laughs> um, this crazy critter also uses camouflage, tough and scaly armor, um, and it inflates itself to about twice its size for protection. Now, uh, Chris gave you a little uh, a sneak peek of the video that's to come, but if you do have a problem with blood, I would close your eyes for the next like 10 seconds. But this video shows a, a short horned lizard squirting blood from its eyes. Oh, so gross and amazing. I'm really glad that we can't do that as people. So cool. Awesome, our next question is turtles can breathe or get their oxygen from their behinds while they're in water. What do you think? Go ahead and comment if you think it's true or false. While we're waiting for your comments, um, a couple fun facts about turtles. This turtle is a painted turtle, which is one of our native species that we have here in Wyoming. Um, they're also found all across the United States. They're very common species of aquatic turtle. Turtle shells are actually a part of their skeleton. So just like we have backbones in our backs, uh, so do turtles, but they line the inside of their shell. So when you see a uh, like comic strip or something like that, where a turtle gets so scared it leaves its shell, that can't happen. We can't leave our backbones and neither can turtles. Another fun fact about turtles is when they are looking for that special someone in their life, a lot of times they're, they'll are they take their fingernails and wave them in front of their face. So my students out there, next time you are looking uh, to ask someone to go to the homecoming dance with you, just wave your fingers in front of your face like a painted turtle and they might say yes. They probably won't, but they might. All right, it looks we like we got a lot of people saying true and that they even learned it from Olaf in Frozen 2. Wow, good job, Olaf, you are correct. It's called cloacal respiration and it helps turtles survive underwater for a long period of time. This next clip shows um, kind of the, the thawing process in the springtime um, after a long, hard freeze over winter. During this time is when turtles are most likely to use cloacal respiration um, because they're not getting that same type of oxygen from the water, since the water's frozen, that they normally would, and it's really hard for them to break through the ice on the top. Great job, everyone. We are on our final Hasty Herp trivia question, and it is, Western hognose snakes have a deadly venom. What do you think? Comment true or false, whichever one you think. One of my favorite gross facts about snakes, while you are commenting if you think it's true or false, is that snakes don't have eyelids the same way that we do. Instead, they have kind of a, a scale over their eyelids. It's similar to a scale, um, just like they do all over their bodies. So when hognose snakes or any other type of snake shed their skin, their uh, eyelid sheds as well. And so when you find a snake skin on the ground, sometimes you see it almost looks like a creepy eye over it. It's really cool. Some reptiles, when they shed their skin, actually eat the skin. Snakes don't really do that as much as lizards, but maybe you'll see a bite taken out of it if you ever have a pet lizard or anything like that at home. Ooh, it looks like this question, we've had the most diversity in our answers. Looks like we're about half true, half false. Let's see, it is false. These drama queens have a very mild venom. Um, so they're basically considered non-venomous to humans. Uh, a lot of times they'll play dead when they are threatened because they're just big drama queens. They also have fangs in the back of their mouth instead of the front. So imagine you wanted to take a bite of a cheeseburger. Normally you're gonna use the teeth in the front of your mouth, right? Well, a hog nose only has its fangs in the back. So it's really, really hard for it to bite anything other than its normal food, which is generally like frogs and toads. Now we've got a clip of our drama queen being dramatic. I think they're so funny. They do a lot of flopping around and acting like, like the whole world is ending if they get threatened. Sometimes they'll even musk, which is when they make a really, really, really stinky smell. 
Oh, I see that some people say that snakes are not our favorite animal. <laughs> totally understandable. There's a lot of, lot of fear around them, uh, but good thing Western hog noses here in Wyoming are um, harmless to humans and they have a cute little nose that goes up like this. <laughs> awesome. So we're moving on now to the messiest, some of the grossest creatures on our planet, mammals. What makes a mammal a mammal? It's an animal that is warm blooded, which means it has to regulate its own body temperature. The way they do that is through things like sweating or panting um, or shivering if they're too cold. They also um, produce milk, they have hair or fur, and they generally give live birth. Now, our very first one is a crazy video. What do you think is going on here? Either turn and talk to the people around you or uh, comment below what you think is happening in this weird video. What is that animal? What's it doing? What could possibly be going on? My first thought was a squirrel got hit by lightning. What do you guys think? Oh, looks like someone said a cat getting a new hairdo. Love it. I agree. I think that is definitely a possibility. <laughs> oh, he's warning you, a spotted skunk. <gasps> someone knows their Wyoming facts about wildlife. That's exactly what's going on. It's a Western spotted skunk giving you a warning. They will stamp their feet really aggressively, do a handstand to warn predators about what's coming next. Which is, oh, a nasty, nasty spray. So gross, that poor black bear is gonna stink for a couple of days. Now, I have a couple cool specimens to show you. Um, I have a spotted skunk pelt if you take a look at it, it's not really that big. It's about a foot long, um, but you can see it's beautiful spots. And if it was standing up, it would look something like that. This is one of the species of skunks that we have here in Wyoming. And another species is the striped skunk, which is like way bigger. You can see from here. Now, both species of, spunk, of skunks are found here and they both have a very similar gross fact. And that is in their behinds, they have these glands that hold about one ounce of uh, spray each, which means if they spray you once and you still don't get the hint, they can keep spraying you. Generally, it only takes one time before a creature realizes they don't wanna eat that. Their spray can also travel about 10 feet and linger in the air for hours. Once as a child, my house got sprayed by a skunk and the whole inside of our house smelled the whole day long. Now, you might have heard that tomato juice is a great way to get rid of skunk smell, but actually it just makes you smell like a tomato and a skunk, not a good combo. But what you can do is mix some hydrogen peroxide, water, baking soda, and dish soap, and that will get the stink off. But hopefully you never have to use that fun fact. Awesome, we're moving on to our next mammal. This is a trivia question for you all. Go ahead and comment which one you think is the largest land mammal in North America. Is it a moose? Is it a polar bear? Is it a bison? Or is it a Kodiak bear? In case you're unfamiliar with Kodiak bears, they're found mostly in Canada and Alaska. Let's see what some of our responses say. I think it's a polar bear. Pajaka is about Wyoming. <laughs> That's true. So maybe, oh, Josh Leonard says bison, bison, bison. Jill says bison. Let's see. Yeah, bison. Oh, Kodiak bear. Nice. Love it. Kodiak bear. Very interesting. Well, in fact, it is a bison. It is also Wyoming State Mammal. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> They're about six feet tall at the shoulder and they weigh about 2,000 pounds. Now for me, I hear 2,000 pounds and I have no idea how big that is. So I did a little bit of research and some math and I figured out that 2,000 pounds is about equal to 4,532 Big Macs. So if you've ever eaten a Big Mac before, just multiply that by over 4,500 and that's the weight of a bison. They're huge. Now a moose is the second largest 
Polar bear is the third and Kodiak bear is the fourth largest. So that was a really tricky question. Now, what I want you all to do is if you feel on the back of your neck, right where your neck meets your back, you might feel some bumps right there. That's normal. <laughs> um, don't be alarmed. If you lean your head forward, you might feel the bumps a little bit better. That is called your spinous process and it's part of your vertebrae. Very important things to keep us standing up and walking and able to do the things we do. Now within a bison, they also are vertebrates, meaning they have a backbone, but their spinous process is huge. Ours is only about that big. We can still feel it, but it's not very big. A bison's on the other hand, I have one with me, is this big. It like doesn't even fit in the screen. <laughs> it's about uh, like two, two and a half feet long. This is the part that would be on their back. So it would be upright like this. And this would be the top of the bison. Um, so imagine if the one on the back of your neck was this big, you would probably get some funny looks. Now, what I want you to do is uh, to turn and talk to a neighbor if you're at a school or if you're sitting around with some friends or go ahead and comment, why do you think a bison has this ridiculously large hump? What is the purpose of it? It's not just there for style, is it? Um, and then we'll see what answers we come up with. Oh, my students say, wow, love it, Terry. That's great. <laughs> I say, wow, too. I think that's crazy. What are some possible answers for why in the world a bison would have this big hump on its back? Ooh, someone says digging. That's a great idea. Pretty close on that one. Awesome. Well, if you guessed it's for super cool dance moves, you're totally right. I'm just kidding. It is for a type of digging. Uh, bison live in really cold places like Wyoming and they eat grass. They don't eat snow. Um, and so in order to get to the grasses that are underneath the snow, they need really strong muscles to break through that snow to get to the grass underneath. Now imagine if next time it snows up here in Wyoming, you are asked by your family to go shovel the snow, but you can only use your head. You would need some pretty crazy muscles to do that, wouldn't you? So that's why they have these awesome, huge cervical vertebrae, so big that it can allow lots of muscles to attach to it to give them that power to get underneath the snow and get to their yummy, yummy grass. Pretty wacky, right? And now, my friends, the grossest, the yuckiest, the definitely smelliest creature on earth is humans, us for sure. We are the grossest, um, especially that little kiddo right there. <laughs> um, some really gross facts about humans is that our mouths produce about one liter of saliva each day. If you have just like a regular size Nalgene, this is my summer camp Nalgene, uh, this is one liter. Imagine this whole thing filled up with saliva. That's disgusting, but very important. The average person has about 67 species of bacteria in their belly button alone. Uh, if that doesn't make you want to take a shower and clean your belly button, then I don't know what would. The average person also loses about eight pounds of skin cells every year. That's a lot of skin. Where does it all go? That's gross. Um, and I love this fact, absolutely. It is estimated that the microorganisms, so the small little teeny tiny critters in and on our body outnumber our own body cells 10 to one. So you are 10 times more microorganisms than you are you. So maybe next time you get a little bit stinky after going for a run or playing outside and your parents are like, you gotta go wash up, you're stinky. You can tell them, it's not me, it's all the microorganisms, they're the stinky ones. It's a good way to get out of things. <laughs> awesome. Well, friends, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you learned something gross, weird, or wacky. If you have any questions, go ahead and throw those in the comments and we'll answer them either uh, throughout this or um, later on today. So tune back in and thank you again. Back to you, Catherine. Awesome. Thank you, Jackie. And uh, 
as Jack, Jackie mentioned, we have a, we have time for some more questions. Uh, and until then, um, while we're waiting, a couple of things, Jackie, we had some questions earlier about tardigrades. Um, one was how long did they live? We know they can be dehydrated for a long time, but do we know how long they live? And also, is it harmful? That's a great question. Um, in terms of how long they live, I think it's it's a very difficult thing for scientists to figure out um, because we don't exactly know how to age them, right? Some animals, it's really easy to age. Like humans, you just say, hey, when's your birthday? Um, or mule deer or elk, you can look at their teeth to age. Tardigrades, a lot harder to figure that out. So unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for that, but I'm going to assume probably 50 years or more if they can stay dehydrated for up to 30 years. Um, and then are they harmful? Great question. They're not. They um, provide food for slightly larger microorganisms, which then provide food for even larger organisms. And we keep going up and up and up in the food chain. So they're actually really beneficial. Scientists are still studying them. Um, so if you're really interested in tardigrades, you could grow up and become a tardigradeologist and learn even more things about them. Great question. A tardigradeologist. <laughs> like fun. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Jackie, thank you. Um, and everybody else, thank you for being here. And could you hit that like button a few times to let to show Jackie your appreciation? Um, that would be awesome. Jackie, thank you. Um, so wrapping up, we've uh, dropped a link to an evaluation in the comment section. So please take just a minute or two to fill that out. We have 10 more of these and we want them to be useful to you uh, and your feedback to how we do better. Um, we will also mail you this really beautiful sticker uh, with a cutthroat trout and a pronghorn on them, uh, and that's for your whole family. So please do join them. Uh, I'm 100% certain that everyone here enjoys and appreciates wildlife, and we have some other opportunities for you to learn more. Teachers, we have a um, educator camp at our beautiful Whiskey Mountain Conservation Camp, and moms, dads, aunts, uncles, grandmas, grandmas. We have several three and four day family camps. Uh, so we would love to have you join us there. And we'll drop those links in the comments as well. Um, any more questions? Let's see, I don't see any. Jackie, I see lots of people. Oh, we got one. Why do deer have such long teeth? Ooh, from YouTube. that's an awesome question. So if we think about the teeth of an animal, it really helps us understand that animal better. So if we think about deer, their primary food source is going to be things like grasses, in the winter, more woody shrubs, things like that. And if you also think about their body shape, their heads are pretty high up for what the things they eat, right? They have to bend down pretty far. Um, so that's part of it. Another reason is if they are eating stuff off of like woody brush, sometimes the best tastiest leaves aren't gonna be at the end. Those might've already been eaten. So they need those long teeth to grab and strip off leaves and plant matter um, from woody brush and things like that. And then allows them to be able to get that kind of nutrients that they need throughout the whole year. Great question. Thank you. And um, Crystal Hyde says, thank you. That was so much fun. And I agree, Jackie. And so if people want to come to camps, they can learn from Jackie as well. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you all for being here. Um, and thanks to our partners from Onyx Hunt. Next week, we'll email you a special discount code for three months free if you complete that form. In the meantime, if you'd like 20% off your subscription to Onyx Hunt, enter the code WILD20, W-Y-L-D-20, and not only will you get 20% off, Onyx will also send $5 to the Wildlife Fund. Our next event is this afternoon, 2 o'clock, with Jupiter, the Great Horned Owl. We'd love to see you there. So more information about Expo or to watch our previously recorded events, go to wyomingexpo.com, click on Expo Live. Thanks so much, folks. Have a great rest of your day and uh, look for those gross, weird, wacky things and take a shower.